are you, Jesus, and who are we? You come in humility, riding the donkey, the weight of all our brokenness and suffering on our shoulders. We sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us, with visions of authority and power consuming us. Who are you, Jesus, and who are we? You slide across the floor, washing our feet, fulfilling the task of a slave. We are arguing with one another. Who will sit at your right and left when you rise to your throne? Who are you, Jesus, and who are we? You are breaking the bread and offering to us heart, broken for us. We are making ghosts, declaring that we will never abandon you. Who are you, Jesus, and who are we? You are offering us a new mouth, which is your life poured out for the forgiveness of all our sins. We stare at one another in the candlelight, wondering who among us will betray you. Who are you, Jesus, and who are we? You are determined to be obedient to your Heavenly Father, even to the point of death on the cross. We are shaking in the shadows, running to hide, hoping to save our own necks. Who are you, Jesus? And who are we? Jesus, we hear you praying for us. Father, forgive us. Now these words of Holy Scripture from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 19, verses 29 through 40. When he, Jesus, had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. 
So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On this day of worship that marks the beginning of Holy Week and our journey with the passion through the passion of our Lord, let us pray together. Lord Jesus, suffering servant of God, we are drawn here by your gospel. You came into a world of sin and suffering to rescue us from our sorry situation, to remind us that we are beloved children of God. We thank you for accepting your errand of mercy. Lord Jesus, suffering servant of God, for our sake, you were obedient unto death. In your final days, you were surrendered your will to fulfill the loving will of your heavenly Father by laying down your life for your friends. We thank you for denying yourself that we might live. Lord Jesus, suffering servant of God, you offer yourself to us today as the bread of life satisfying our hunger, as the living water that flows through us into all the world, as the love that will not let us go, as the life that refuses to retreat in the face of death. We thank you for your obedience even unto death. Lord Jesus, suffering servant of God, as we follow you, loving you, May we experience the gift of joy hidden in your obedience, the gift of hope revealed in our suffering, the gift of rising from dying, the gift of love absorbing all evil through mercy and forgiveness. We thank you for these gifts which bestow eternal life. Amen. continue now with our reading from the gospel according to Luke chapter 19 verses 41 through 46. 
As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave within you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Then he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, Christians all over the world are celebrating Palm Sunday with waving palm branches, children singing, and joyful hosannas. Given what we know awaits Jesus in the coming weeks, I wonder if we are not trying to hide from something or perhaps to run away from something with all of our talk about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. You see, we possess a startling ability to see only what we want to see and to hear only what we want to hear. Sometimes we are so committed to our version of how things happened and what was said that we soon believe that our version of the events is the accurate one. If someone challenges us, we slyly reply, reply, it's my story and I'm sticking to it. When it comes to our version of the events of Palm Sunday, it appears that we have formulated our story around pictures we saw as children in Sunday school with Jesus on a donkey and people with palm branches or from some television presentation or Hollywood movie about the life of Jesus, or maybe from a dramatic presentation described in a cantata we sang during this holy season, or even from dramatic portrayals like the life of Christ in living pictures we presented here in this sanctuary more than 25 times. Our personal version of the events of Palm Sunday may go something like this. Thousands and thousands of men and women and children traveling along the road from Galilee through Jericho to Jerusalem. They are on their way to celebrate the Passover in the holy city. At some point, the crowd becomes aware of the sound of a low rumble rolling down upon them from the Mount of Olives. Faintly at first they hear, Hosanna, Hosanna. The sound marches on, growing stronger and stronger and stronger. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Their eyes catch glimpses of cloaks tossed into the sky. Palm branches waving in the air. Suddenly, Jesus appears riding on a donkey. Thousands of voices begin to spontaneously chant, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. This may be a popular version of what happened that day, but it has very little in common with what Dr. Luke tells us happened that day. Luke's version clashes with our version in significant ways. The triumphant entry into Jerusalem wasn't triumphant at all. It is a small, planned demonstration by Jesus and his disciples. There is nothing spontaneous about it. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for Passover. He comes to the Mount of Olives 
and stops. He sends two of his disciples into a village to get a coat that is already tied there. Everything has been prearranged. By whom? We are not told. They bring the colt to Jesus. They make something of a saddle with their cloaks. Jesus straddles the colt. As he rides along, unverified people spread their cloaks along the road. The disciples of Jesus, a multitude of them, Luke says. But truly, how many of them could there have been? Twelve, forty, seventy, three hundred, at the most, perhaps five hundred they began to joyfully praise God for all the deeds of power they had seen, proclaiming, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest heavens. The Pharisees, for whatever reason, urged Jesus to silence his disciples. Jesus replies rather casually, if they were silent, the stones would shout out. Did you notice how Luke's version of Palm Sunday clashes with our version? Luke says nothing about any shouts of Hosanna. Nothing about any thunderous voices bouncing off the walls of Jerusalem. Luke quashes our version of the triumphant entry. It is a good thing that Luke correct, corrects our version. For we are people who are tempted to write our script for Jesus to follow, creating for ourselves a Lord and Savior we believe we can confess and follow. Everyone, it seems, wants to tell Jesus how to be their Messiah. There is John at his baptism shouting out to the crowd, I baptize you with water, he will baptize you with fire. Soaking wet from his baptism, the mess messianic dreams of God's people ride, Jesus ride on Jesus back into the wilderness to test him. Feed us, fill our stomachs, give us what we want. Deliver us, defeat our enemies, restore the glory of our nation. Do something spectacular so that we may see and believe. Jump off the highest pinnacle of the temple. And now, on the way to Jerusalem... His disciples are writing their own version of what will happen there when they seize power and Jesus is crowned king. They are confident of their version of how things are going to go down in Jerusalem for they have seen Jesus feed thousands of people with a few fish and some loaves. They have seen Jesus walk on the water. They have seen him raise the dead. They believe that he is their version of what the Messiah should be, a triumphant Messiah. They are blinded by their own versions of what is to come. This crowd singing, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, is composed of true believers. They have left homes and families and businesses to follow this itinerant preacher carpenter from Nazareth. They are absolutely desperate for him to be the king of the Jews. We can be certain. We will not see a single person in this crowd on the streets of Jerusalem early on Friday morning, shouting, Crucify Him, crucify Him. For they are true believers today, Palm Sunday.
Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. On this Palm Sunday, something he has done since he was a boy of 12. But Jesus knows this will be his last trip to Jerusalem. He knows what everyone else refuses to hear. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked, insulted, spat upon, flogged, and killed. Jesus has tried to tell them at least three times, and three times they refuse to hear him, for their minds are filled with visions of power. They are determined to see this as his triumphant arrival in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. They cannot see that this is a death march. As we begin our journey through Holy Week, I'm afraid that we may be just as clueless as that first crowd on that first Palm Sunday as to what God was up to as Jesus goes to Jerusalem. Like them, we have never come to grips with the truth that Jesus must die, that he must be wounded for our sake. We cannot comprehend this divine mystery of how this cross of Jesus saves and redeems all humanity. We are unable to grasp how God is saving and redeeming us through the physical, emotional, mental, and soul-crushing suffering Jesus must endure to convince us of God's suffering love. We don't understand how good might come to us out of his rejection. His first disciples could not imagine a Messiah that died. Two millennium later, we do not seem to know what to do with a Messiah, a Son of God, who is so powerless, who suffers rejection, who dies so predictably, who becomes the Lamb that was slain. This is not the way we envisioned He would save us. We don't know what to make of His suffering on cross. We haven't yet grasped the face of God's suffering love, nor understood that God will do anything, even be crossed, to recover His children lost to the world. We try to make the cross something useful for us. Jesus died in our place, we say. We cannot embrace such a humiliated Christ, so we create a theological crutch that says he had to die to satisfy his father's need for a perfect sacrifice to satisfy his cry for justice, never stopping to ponder what kind of father we have just made God. We diminish his suffering, only a brief interlude before an empty tomb. If possible, we would skip the whole death scene. We even call the darkest day in human history Good Friday. We want a different version of the passion of Christ. One without suffering, without rejection, without humiliation, and without crucifixion. Living in the world, the real world, our world, we are reluctant to declare a suffering and dying Jesus as Lord of our lives. After all, what will it get us? Having found our success and our place in the world, why bother ourselves with the kingdom 
Jesus proclaimed and died for. A kingdom, a family of God's children, a community of faith, where the humble are lifted up and the proud are humbled, where the hungry are fed and the well-fed go away hungry, where the poor become rich and the rich become poor, where the grief-stricken rejoice and the happy-go-lucky are filled with sorrow, where those first in line go to the end of the line and those last in line are invited to go to the front, where enemies are loved, where hands are open to every beggar who begs, where even the wicked and the ungrateful receive the kindness and mercy of God. Somehow, we must come to grips with the inclusiveness and universal dimensions of what God is doing for all humanity through the suffering and the death of His beloved Son. Jesus is not just our Savior. Jesus is the Savior of the world. We don't have a say in who He saves or how He saves. God has no favorites. God is impartial to a fault. His mercy is not just for good people. It is a gift for the wicked and the ungrateful too. He forgives not only our sins, but the sins of the entire world. His love is not limited to us and to our children, but He embraces all children in all places and all circumstances scattered all around the world. He does not return evil for evil, but good for evil. He does not curse His enemies. He prays for them. He does not use violence to establish peace. He absorbs the violence into Himself, for by His stripes peace comes. We could not write this script for our salvation even if we thought we wanted to. We would never place a cross in our version of how God saves, redeems, and reconciles all of His beloved children unto Himself. With cross, it is simply too horrible and depressing for us. Yet on this day, Palm Sunday, a day filled with dreams of power and glory, of vindication and victory for us, Luke tells us that Jesus laments over His people because they were rejecting the only way to peace available to them. They reject His way to peace through His peaceable kingdom. And so they will be crushed and destroyed and scattered by the powers that dominate this world. And then on this Palm Sunday, Jesus goes to clear out the temple, for it was supposed to be a house of prayer for all peoples, but they have corrupted it. They have turned it into a place, they have turned a place where God was to be worshipped into a place of corruption and greed and power. I understand that we would like a better version of things. We would truly like this day to be a day of triumph. It can be, but only after all the facts our end, the fact that Jesus is turned over to his enemies, the fact that he is rejected, humiliated, and crossed, the fact that by Friday afternoon he is dead as any man's son. And we must embrace the truth beyond, behind all the facts, for the tomb will be empty. 
The gospel we preach is a hard one, grounded in the suffering love of God, revealed in the very real suffering of God's beloved Son. So this we preach from this pulpit and nothing else. We preach Christ. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to religious folks and foolishness to all others. But for those, for those of us who struggle to believe, the very power of God, the love of God, that makes the world right. Amen. May we carry these words with us as we go into this week. Now we walk in the shadows, for the night is coming. Jesus our Lord goes on ahead of us to be betrayed and denied, rejected and humiliated, abandoned and crucified. He is the incarnation of God's suffering love. In his dying, there is mercy and life for all. In his tomb, the Father's love hovers over him. He will rise to be our crucified, risen, and living Lord.